Uh, in the last uh, year or so, I've been going around the world trying to talk to people about the issues of open science and specifically uh, this project that we've been doing here. Uh, it's really about judgment and decision making, uh, but since we're here in the psychiatry department at the hospital, I'm going to talk about broader issues of what it means uh, uh, to do open science, why we need open science, what are the circumstances that led me to do open science. And I just want to say this is a very uh, long presentation. It includes more than 100 slides. We're not going to go through the 100 slides, but you can download these. So if you scan this or you go to this URL on the top, you're welcome to uh, take all the slides and go uh, over things that I will not be talking about today. So I'm going to ignore the, the project that we're doing in judgment decision making, but I'm going to be here the whole day. Uh, it's dedicated to you. So if you want to meet me afterwards and talk a little bit about what we're doing, uh, then, I'm, then I'm very happy to. Um, but generally what it is that I uh, talk about is that I invite people to go with me on a journey. And it's the journey that I've been going through in the last few years. Uh, I am a very early career researcher, so I've been an assistant professor for two years. This is my third year. Before that, I was a postdoc in the University of Illinois and uh, Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And now I'm based in, in Hong Kong. Uh, I did not grow up in psychology. I grew up in management in the business school and I transitioned into a psychology department. So lots of interesting uh, reasons why this is happening. And a lot of it has to do uh, with uh, what is called the replication, reproducibility crisis that I will be uh, covering very, very briefly. And it has led me to the conclusion that we have to improve the way that we do research we also have to change the way that we teach. If you're a university and you have undergraduate students, uh, uh, students that are not research oriented, and then we have to work together. I think uh, psychologists in general kind of uh, work on their own different labs in different parts of the world. And now we need to kind of mass mobilize uh, researchers as a first step for us to work together. In the last seven, eight years, psychologists have learned how to work together. And we didn't know how to do this before. But even more importantly is that after we understand how we work internationally, we can also start working with our students to mass mobilize the students uh, as early as second year undergraduate to do real science. Maybe a little bit more difficult in psychiatry and you know med medical sciences, but in social psychology, what I'm doing, it's much it's much more uh, uh, feasible. This is about my own journey. Typically what I do is like a one hour to talk about the crisis and then what I did and then our project. I'm going to ignore the last part and mainly focus on the first two about, about the crisis. I also added a few things about showing you hands-on uh, what it means uh, to do questionable research practices and p-hacking, which is usually something I don't do. I don't do uh, but I wanted to give you uh, a sense of the abuse of statistics that we've been doing uh, so that's more of a, uh, I'm going to show you stuff uh, on a website uh, of, of what it is that led to this uh, crisis. So for me, the crisis started in my third year of a PhD. I started my PhD uh, in 2009. 2011, um, this paper came out. So we're talking about uh, this journal. So for us, this is a very big journal, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And this uh, experiment, uh, this study had nine experiments. It had over a thousand participants. And it was very shocking to us because the person who uh, wrote this article, uh, Daryl Bem, is the person who uh, uh, collaborated on writing the introduction to social psychology, which we teach our undergraduate, uh, undergraduate students. And the conclusion of this study was that people are able to feel the future. So there's scientific evidence that people react to stimuli that happen into the future. And for us, we kind of, we looked at this paper. It's in one of our best journals. It has so many experiments showing so much evidence in support of something that we know from physics, our understanding of the universe uh, challenges what this paper was trying to show. So first of all, is it possible that this is solid evidence? If not, why is it published in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology? How did Daryl Bam come to do uh, and show evidence for this sort of thing. So we tried to ask Daryl Bems, so can you please show us, maybe it's fraud, please open up your uh, data. And he shared all the data. We asked him, did you do this, did you do that? So everything that he shared with us seemed to show that he was using best practices back in 2011, showing evidence for something that we know is impossible. So we were kind of thinking, it's like, okay, so if he's able to show evidence for something that we know is impossible, 
then maybe other findings in this journal, Journal of Personality Social, Social Psychology, or other journals that we respect, like psychological science, maybe if uh, uh, this is able to publish over there, maybe other findings are impossible. How do we know if this is uh, possible or not possible? We try to uh, replicate, we try to repeat this. So not Daryl Bam, we give this to other labs and we say, please follow exactly what this person did and see uh, if you get the same results. And it's amazing that if, at least in social psychology, up till 2011, we didn't do replications. We didn't do replications because no journal will ever publish replications and we want to publish at the best journals. So only in 2012, following this article and a few other articles that came out, we decided we need to work together to start and replicate. And we didn't know if things will replicate or not. This did not replicate. But we thought, okay, here we know this is improbable. How about other things that we trust, that we know works in social psychology, that we teach our undergraduate? Will these replicate? So it took us a while. We started 2012. It took us about three years to get all the labs to work together, many labs around the world, and publish findings. And then came 2015, 2016. So this is a summary from the British Psychological Society. And this is the headline. It's only 10 studies, but there's actually a lot more than 10 studies about things that we teach our students in social psychology, but they fail to replicate. So we have over here Amy Cuddy. She's very famous because she's one of the top TED Talks about if you stand like this in front of the mirror and you do a Wonder Woman power pose, then it means that you're able to do better in negotiations and in job interviews because it increases confidence, but it also has bodily effects. So this doesn't replicate. Uh, New York Times bestseller, a lot of things over here. TED Talk is still there, even though we failed to replicate. Uh, so it's, it's a problem with this. This is a very famous one about embodiment. So if we make you frown or we make you smile by holding a pen in a certain way, then this affects uh, your ability to uh, uh, you know, appreciate humor or ranking how uh, humorous some cartoons are. This is one that I'm going to talk about because this is one that is uh, personally related to me. This is, belongs to a lab that I exchanged to during my PhD. Self-control is a limited resource. Every social psychology book that you open has self-control, willpower, ego depletion into it. And the basic uh, uh, idea here is that you have a limited resource of self-control. You use self-control, you have less and less of it. So if you use self-control for this task, and the classic task was you sit in a room with cookies, but you can't eat the cookies. So you look at the cookies and you're waiting for, the, you know, for, for, for leaving the room. So you can't, you can't eat these cookies. And then you take, to, uh, take into another room and you have a different self-control task. And then you do much worse in it because you resisted the cookies. So this seems to have a big issue. And I'm going to talk about this in specific. And then also these social priming issues, like if you unscramble sentences about some keywords, then this affects you in some way. But this is the one that made the big change. And it didn't just make the change in social psychology. This started a big change in science overall. So this is a science paper that published something in social psychology. It might happen a lot in medical sciences and psychiatry, but this doesn't happen a lot in social psychology. But this was a big thing. So in 2015, Science Journal published a uh, mass collaboration of many labs of social psychology around the world to try and replicate many findings. What did they find? This is the main uh, summary of the whole thing. So they ran 100 of these, 97 of these. Only 36 of these replicated. And we're talking about our best journals. So Journal of Psychological Science, JPSP, you know, the, the top of the field, things that we thought are going to be very solid and, and easily replicable. What you see on the left are p-values. So typically, when we look for evidence to reject the null hypothesis, we look at the p-value, and if p-value is lower than 0 0.05, we say, okay, we found some evidence that is not likely to you know, be just uh, uh, according to, to chance. Um, so if you look at the original studies over there on the left, all of them are lower than 0 0.05. If you look at the replications, it's much bigger spread, and it's all over the place, from uh, lower than 0 0.05 to up to like 1%. And then if you look at the effect size, so the impact of uh, the, the manipulation of the intervention, what you see over here is all of these in the original studies are higher than the null, higher than zero. But if you look at the replications, it's like all over the place and much closer to the null. 
So for us, this was a big shock. So even in the ones that replicated, only 36% replicated, but even in the ones that replicated, the effect size was half. So if we originally published 0.4, then we see that the replications are 0.2. Big shock to us. Now I'm going to focus on ego depletion as something that uh, uh, was, was very important to me. So ego depletion, this uh, idea that self-control is a limited resource, did uh, a mass replication effort because of a new analysis based on a meta-analysis. So they did a meta-analysis, they found an effect, but then they did publication bias adjustment. It means that if you take into consideration that meta-analyses only include you know, published findings, if you account for this, the effect becomes very close to zero. So they decided... We're going to do a mass replication on this. What they did is 24 labs from around the world, 2,000 participants. What did they find? In ego depletion, again, I want to remind you in the last decade or two, ego depletion is one of the strongest findings in social psychology. Thousands of articles published with support for this. Now, these 24 labs included researchers that have published, done research on ego depletion for a long time. These are experts in ego depletion. I'm going to show you the response of one of the lead experts on ego depletion on what he saw in this mass replication of, uh, effort. So his name is Michael Inslet. This is his Twitter account. And everybody was waiting to see the results of the ego depletion mass replication effort. And this is what he writes. Big news. Registered replication report of ego depletion reveals no effect, not a zip, nothing. Now, from his personal blog, which you can go and have a look because he's very open about uh, his personal reactions, this is what he writes. I have spent nearly a decade working on the concept of ego depletion. I have been rewarded for this work. The reason why I get any uh, invitations to speak in seminars, brown bags, and all this is because of this work. And for me, as a postdoc, Seeing this sentence was a big shock. This is what he writes. The problem is that ego depletion might not be a thing. How could it be that you've done research on ego depletion for over a decade, published a lot of findings in the best of journals, and now because of this mass replication effort, you're saying maybe, maybe ego depletion is not a real thing? How could this be? And this is his summary. Sometimes I wonder whether I should be fixing myself more to drink, and he's talking about alcohol. I am in a dark place. I feel like the ground is moving from underneath me. I no longer know what is real and what is not. So he's saying, and people that covered him are saying that a lot of top social psychology researchers, he's one of the seniors in our field, has been doing research on uh, things that we consider to be solid, are considering leaving the profession or drinking themselves to death, drowning themselves in booze. And the summary, and this is a very strong summary, we had no idea how wrong we could be. So I was really curious because I was uh, uh, working with people during my exchange in my PhD. I was working with Roy Baumeister, definitely one of the top social psychologists ever. Prolific, hundreds of thousands of citations. Really, this guy is unbelievable. You know, about something, something like uh, 500 articles, a lot of books published. And he's the one, together with Kathleen Voss, that initiated ego depletion. They've been doing this for a very long time. So I was really curious to see what will Roy Baumeister say? He must have some reaction to this. How could it be? So their response is misguided effort with elusive implications. You, you did it all wrong. This is not how you do ego depletion. Uh, you used the wrong procedures. You asked us for our opinion, but we say go ahead. We didn't pay a lot of attention. But the good thing about this reaction, a lot of negative things over here, but the good thing about this reaction is this paragraph over here on the right. And what they wrote... And this is taking responsibility. They said, we will organize a pre-registered multi-site replication project next year using well-tested procedures, not this procedure, good procedures that we know that worked. And we will show you ego depletion worked. So this is 2016. We really waited to see from Roy Baumeister and Kathleen Voss what is going to be the evidence for ego depletion, the best finding in social psychology in all of our books that we know works. So we waited. One year, 2017, nothing came out. But finally, 2018, we had an SPSP. This is one of our biggest conferences, a symposia by Kathleen Voss. It's the same case, Kathleen Voss from here. And this is the abstract. It didn't reveal anything about the conclusions, so we were very curious. 
we conducted a large scale replication effort, not 24 labs, but 40 labs, not just frequent tests, no hypothesis significance testing, but also Bayesian and all sorts of other uh, uh, complicated stuff. So what is the evidence? I was not in this conference, but I was following things through Twitter. People were live tweeting because this was a big event. And as the event unfolded, as we tracked Twitter, it became very clear that we're up for a very big disappointment. So this is the live tweet. I, you can't really see what's going on over here, but you can see one of the seniors is live tweeting this in, in anticipation. And finally, the effect is a Cohen's D of 0.08, if you understand correlations better, so it's about 0 0.03. That means that if you do a power analysis and you want to run your own study, you will need a sample size of about 5,000 participants. If there is an effect, it's a very, very, very small effect. So to me, to Michael, to a lot of people who've been doing ego depletion or following ego depletion, this is the end of ego depletion two mass replication efforts. The second one is by the original authors, fails to find conclusive strong support for ego depletion. If there is anything in there, it's a very, very, very weak effect. Definitely nothing that I would ever recommend any of my students to pursue. Nothing that I would ever uh, uh, suggest as an intervention. How could it be? How could it be that we've published thousands of articles on ego depletion and now after almost uh, uh, you know, two decades of doing ego depletion, we come to the conclusion that this is not, not uh, a real effect. So here what you see, this is our index, replication index. It's a guy called Uli and he summarized the quote from ba Baumeister and Voss. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a lot of p-values. And the p-values in the white are the ones that are published, all those that are slightly lower than 0 0.05. But for every one of those, there's a lot of p-values that are above 0 0.05. But we, if we submit this to the journals, the journals say, not interesting because you didn't find anything, so kick it out. And finally, we learn, so we don't waste our time to write a manuscript with p-value up or higher than 0 0.05. So we don't submit this, we just put this in the file drawer. So it looks like for every published study of ego depletion, there has to be a lot of uh, findings uh, that don't show an effect that we just never submitted to the, to the journals. Now, listening to me about this, that's one thing. Maybe not that convincing, I'm an outsider, but if you want to learn from Michael Inslet, the one who I showed you his blog, he has a podcast and it's an amazing podcast. It's called Two Psychologists, Four Beers. So at the beginning of the podcast, they drink two beers and then they become very open-minded and they talk a lot. So Michael Inslet over here talks to Yoel Inbar and Yoel Inbar is one of the people who helped expose one of the biggest frauds in social psychology in Tilburg University with uh, Diedrich Stapel. So they discuss what happened with ego depletion and it's heartbreaking for me to hear this. It's really, it's very, very difficult for me to hear that one of the top social psychologists, you know, done ego depletion, now suddenly doesn't know what is real and what is not. And also hearing from Yoel Inbar how he exposed this fraud in Tilburg University. So on one side, we have these questionable research practices. On the other side, we have issues of fraud, and they discuss this in great detail. Highly recommended. You have the links. You can follow this later. So we started this pretty uh, early compared to other uh, uh, fields. 2012, we started. It took some time for things to build up. So here we have the ego depletion, ego depletion 2. We have the science paper. But in 2018, we had other mass collaboration finally ending. So here, this one is really important because people said, of course, psychological science, that's not a, a good journal. You know, psychological science, it covers only psychology, and psychology is blah, blah, it's a weak science, it's not really a science, you know, all sorts of things. But if you publish in Journal of Science, if you publish in Journal of Nature, everything will replicate. So they said, okay, let's take findings from social psychology published in Nature and Science and see if it replicates. And what you can see here is that only 13 out of 21 replicated. And in those 13, the effect size was about half. Over here, another mass replication, 28. So only 14 out of the 28 replicate. So if you take all of these together, all of the big mass replication efforts that we've been doing in social psychology for about six, seven years now, this is the summary. So you have many labs one, many labs two, many labs three, the science paper, uh, this thing about science and nature and uh, uh, something in economics. Finally, you've got 47%, 90 out of 190. And 
the effect size is about half in the ones that did replicate. Now, we can have a discussion about, is this good? Is this bad? Did you expect higher? Did you expect lower? I don't really know. But we as a field in social psychology took this as a very bad indicator, like that something is, is, is wrong. Something is bad. Because if we take a social psychology uh, book and for every finding, we need to flip a coin to decide randomly if this is going to work or not. This is not good uh, uh, scientific evidence. And this is not what we want to leave for the field. What else have been we doing? We've been doing a lot of other things. So all of these are mass replication efforts. And a lot of things fail to replicate, especially regarding priming, embodiment, uh, and, and a few other things. But there's some good news because some things do replicate. And this is a, a good examples for two of those. If you want, you can click any of these links and it will lead you to the mass replication uh, effort. Now, usually the, the, main, the main reaction, especially to the 2015, is that of course, psychology, we didn't really expect much, but if we go to the medical sciences, if we go to chemical uh, sciences, if we go to uh, other fields, then things will be uh, a lot better. The replication rate will be a lot higher. But then these uh, findings started to happen. So starting from 2015, other fields said, we are going to show you that we're doing much better than psychology. And then all these headlines started to come up. <coughs> In medicine, the sciences start working. Chemical research, can it be fixed? Economics has a problem. Cancer research is, is in, a, in a big mess. So I summarize for you what it is that we know right now. And the problem is we don't know a lot because in other fields, not in psychology, in other fields, we've only been doing this for about two, three years. And we don't have good evidence because we haven't been doing replications. In social psychology, things are a little bit easier because, you know, we can get large samples fairly quickly and we, we share... Uh, Sometimes we share our, our, our materials, but you know, when you have patents in medical, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, chemical research, people tend to kind of keep everything to themselves and not share anything. So all this is preliminary. So take this uh, into consideration. You can go into the links and have a look at each one of those. This is a summary of the social sciences that people said is like a weak science, blah, blah, research and all this. And generally we have Social psychology, let's say about 50%. It's probably a little bit lower than that because I didn't include a lot of things in it. Economics did a, a first one, and it was about 33%. Then experimental economics, which is more like behavioral economics. So it ranges, and it seems like some fields in psychology are doing a little bit better than others, but we still don't know because we haven't done many of those. So cognitive psychology seems to do fairly well compared to the others. Personality, perhaps, it depends. But how are the other sciences doing? So this is what we have right now uh, based on the very little that we've been doing. So there's some initial evidence from the uh, 2012. So uh, cancer research, you know, 11 to 25 and all sorts of others. But this one here, cancer biology, that's one of the biggest ones. And this is ongoing right now. They started from 50 big cancer related research that they wanted to reproduce and replicate. However, out of 50, they could only do this with 18 because for 32, they couldn't even find the process, the materials, what it is that they did over there. When they contacted the authors, the authors said, we can't help you. I'm sorry. So they could only do this for 18. Till now, they've completed 14. And nine out of the 14 seems to have some support for the original effect, but the effects are typically uh, uh, weaker than that. So if we take this you know, out of... Uh, this ratio, it's somewhere between 19 to 50, depends on how it is that you interpret this. But even this one, 18 out of 50 are reproducible. You can't even reproduce 32 out of the 50. That's just not what science is supposed to be. So nature at some point decided to ask people, not just psychologists, ask people in general, do you think that we have a crisis? And this is what the uh, survey said. 52 said, said, yes, we have a significant crisis. 38 said, yes, slight crisis. We need to make some adjustment. We can fix this. And then there's 3%, typically a very senior scholars, that say, no, there's no crisis. What are you talking about? Everything that we've been doing in science, everything is good. So depends on how you want to interpret this, but it does seem like there is a growing consensus that we have been doing something wrong and we need to fix it. We need to address this in some way. Now, I'm going to talk about how is this possible. Now, there's many aspects to this uh, so-called crisis. 
And we need to ask ourselves, is like, what is the most important? What is it that we want to address? I will not go into all of it. These are courses that I give, and I, it takes a whole semester to discuss all of them. I'm going to discuss the issue of p-hacking and the issue of how is it that we found support, evidence, publishable in the best journals for something that maybe is just random noise. How could it be? This is a good uh, example. So uh, this is uh, based on real evidence, and this is, uh, came out in the media about the association between chocolate and weight loss. And of course, people loved this. It became viral, so you had a lot of uh, headlines about this. Has the world gone cocoa? Eating chocolate can help you lose weight. The more chocolate you eat, the, the more weight that you lose. So it's remarkable. And every once in a while you have this about drinking wine. We have this about all sorts of things that we know are not going to help you lose weight, but they find support for this. So after this became viral, the person who did this experiment or did this research came out in his personal blog and confessed. And this is what he confessed. I fooled millions into thinking chocolate helps weight loss. Here's how. This is not fraud. He explains how he did this, and he wanted to show how bad our research practices are. This is what he did. Here's a dirty little secret, science secret. If you measure a large number of things about a small number of people, you are almost guaranteed to, take, to get a statistically significant result. What did he do? He measured 18 different measurements, weight, cholesterol, sodium, blood protein, blah, 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 blah. He only did this for 15 people, and then he dropped one of them because he had some strange reason for it. And then this is a recipe. This is how you get false positives. So if you take any measurements, you know, you take a big data set and you have 18 measurements and you plot the correlations table, finally you will find something that is false positive because of the randomness of the universe. There's a lot of noise there. But this is exploratory research. This is not conformatory research. So after you find something like this, you have to repeat this. But we don't know how to repeat research. We don't know how to do replications. So this is a big, a big issue. This is another example. Even if we see exactly the same data, we have different interpretation, interpretations of this. So this is from uh, the Clinton-Trump race. So what they did over here, we gave four good po posters, the same raw data, exactly the same. And they said, who is going to win? Try and predict this. Who is going to win, Hillary or Trump? And you can see the differences in data analysis. So they analyzed things in different way. And not surprising, the, these four, Clinton, 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 were Clinton supporters. And this guy over here, he was a Trump supporter. So it seems like your ideology influences your decisions about how you want to analyze the data. Now, uh, I'm going to show you very quickly a simulator. This is an R Shiny app. R is a statistical or like a programming language that we use for statistics. And they do Shiny apps where you can very easily manipulate all sorts of things and it simulates uh, the data. So I'm going to try and open this. Hopefully it will load quickly. So this is a Shiny app created uh, to experience uh, statistics. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to simulate random noise as if there is no effect whatsoever. And I'm going to show you that I can do all sorts of things in order to get p-value of 0 0.05. So a random data set, there's nothing in there. There should be no effect whatsoever. But just by doing things, I can show you support for something that should, should not get any support. So how do we do this? You can type in your favorite effect. So for example, here I can type in, I want my favorite effect is ego depletion. And then I have a control group. Uh, I'm going to leave this at like 20 participants because this is used to be in 2011, this used to be uh, the sample size. Unfortunately, in neuroscience, medical research, cancer research, sample sizes are very small because they're very high, hard to obtain. Social psychology, we're a little bit lazy. Now we try to do better. We can do better. But in places like med medical sciences, this is really difficult. Now we're going to do what the chocolate person did. And we're going to measure a lot of DVs, a lot of dependent variables, a lot of outcomes. And then we're going to run the experiment. So you can see here that the true effect is zero. So if I simulate things with zero, I should not have any p-value lower than 0 0.05, right? So if I run this new experiment, I'm going to run this. So you can see for every one of the dependent variables, 
I have a p-value and I have the effect, the statistics, right? And right now what you can see is that over here, there's something that's a little bit closer to 0 0.05. So already here, there's something that indicates at least dv7 close to 0 0.05. So I, uh, I want to use this. I want to uh, see maybe I can get a publication out of it. So what it is that I can do, I can go over here and I can do a scatter plot of dv7. And then I can see uh, all the uh, participants that were in there. And then after I look at this and I see, you know, the control and ego depletion, I want to find support for ego depletion. So it's not that I am uh, biased in any way, but now looking at the data, I remember that this participant over here could guess the, the, uh, the intentions of the experiment or they were sick that day. So maybe I just take this one out, just like the chocolate guy did. And then I took this one out. And if I go back over here, Finally, I have lower than 0 0.05 success. Now I can publish a paper in one of the best journals. But I will only publish DV7 because that's the one that I care about. The rest, you know, the file draw are not interesting. Not, nobody wants. But there's a bigger issue. And the bigger issue, so we know that Daryl Bem with Feeding the Future did not do this. What did Daryl Bem do? How could it be that he found support for Feeding the Future? So over here, if you run this, there's something called now phack. Let's try and see. Maybe one DV is not enough. Maybe we want more DVs. Maybe we can get better publication and a higher journal. So let's p-hack. So I'm going to move over here. And what you can do is you can peak and add participants. So at the beginning, you start with a sample size of 20 uh, per control and experimental. But let's say that you didn't find what you wanted. You can just add cases and look. Add cases and look. So you peak a lot. Every time that you peak, something changes. And because of the randomness of the universe, there is something that's called the dance of the p-values. Dance go up, go down, go up, go down. I'm going to show you this dance. So I'm going to add participants. And I, I want you to look at the p-values and how the p-values change. So let's add some participants. So I'm going to add participants. I added 10. Already the effect disappeared for DV7. So I'm going to add a little bit more. I'm going to add some more. And you can see the dance of how these things change. Some of them go uh, away from 0 0.05, but there's some that get a little bit closer. So maybe this one is an opportunity. We don't know. So we add a little bit more, more. This is getting closer. Now it's going away. So we add a little bit more. We add a little bit more. So we added a bunch of them. And finally, success, you know, not DV7. Now it's suddenly a different DV, so DV10. So and remember that all this is like random noise. It's not supposed to show any effect. So now I have this effect and I can ignore all the rest and I can publish. But we wanted two DVs to show a p-value of lower than 0 0.05. One is not enough. So I'm just going to keep dancing with this. I'm going to add more and more and see what happens. And finally, I added enough success. Now I have both DV7 and DV9. And now I can publish a paper and have better uh, results. So, now we laugh at this because we know that this is wrong. But I remember a time in 2011 where this was common practice. Like we saw uh, finding a p-value of 0 0.06 or 0 0.08. And then, you know, the lead researchers, people that I know and trust told me, yeah, just run a few more participants. Then it will become lower than 0 0.05. And then you can publish this. So a lot of disturbing things about this. What about the subgroup analysis? Yeah, so you can do this. You can do all sorts of subgroup analysis. You can also control for age, gender. So I'm going to show you a summary slide of all the famous questionable research practices, this p-hacking that we do. Uh, where was I? So we were yeah, here. All right. Another really interesting, like we don't have a lot of time, but this is a, a really interesting simulation from 538. It's a great website that shows how with exactly the same data set, Republicans and Democrats can get completely opposite interpretations of who is better for the economy, Democrats or Republicans. So it takes real data about the US economy, and then it shows you how maybe Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, analyze this in different way. Fascinating. They will take you step by step, so you don't need to do too much. Just follow this link and see what it is that they do. Now, this is, this is an example of what people used to do. So in 2012, when we realized with Daryl Bam feeling the future, we realized that people are doing all kinds of things that are bad statistically. And this is summarized here 
in what's called false positive psychology. Now it's a very well known uh, uh, paper in psychological science. This is what people do. So they do all sorts of things like remove outlier, like what I showed you, they add 10 cases, they redo analysis with uh, adapted dependent variables. Uh, they do all sorts of th things uh, like do sub subgroup analysis, they control for variant, and then finally, until they found effect, and then they write the paper afterwards. So this is from the false positive psychology. It shows you that if you take any one of these practices, like controlling for gender or interaction, or dropping one condition, or adding uh, things, you can increase the chances of finding a p-value lower than 0 0.05 by 60%. So 60% of the times you will find an effect. If you add more, and since 2011 we realized other things that we've been doing wrong, you can basically guarantee almost close to 100% that you'll be able to find an effect over here. Now, how can we know that this is happening? We know this because we can analyze the dip distribution of p-values in the literature. So this is what these guys did over here. It examines 258,000 test results from a lot of articles from different disciplines. This is not even just psychology. And typically, if just by the randomness of the universe and the way that you do statistics, if there's an effect, there should be an exponential uh, distribution where most of the things are lower than p-value of 0 0.001. So this one here makes sense. So a lot of p-values need to be lower than 0.05. And then it should decrease. The higher you go with p-value, it should decrease, should decrease, should decrease. And then here, just below 0 0.05, we have this amazing jump, almost as high as this one. And this is a deviation. This shows a real problem. Why is it that we have all these things over here? It could be that researchers are pushing their findings to be just below 0 0.05 because somehow we decided the 0 0.05 is our threshold for publishing in top journals. If you want to uh, have uh, uh, some analysis, let's say that you're doing a literature review and you want to start a thesis or a project, a research project, and you want to know how reliable is this literature? Does it have this kind of, of p-value distribution or does it have a, a reliable p-value distribution? Now we have tools. We've started to develop this, and I'm actually pretty proud that social psychologists are the ones that realize some of these problems and came out with some of these solutions, working together with statisticians and people from other sciences. So we have this tool called P-Checker, which is great. It's a one-stop shop. It's a shiny app in R. Uh, you know, it's the same interface that allows you to take all the statistics from the articles, that you are covering to check if they're reliable. So what you can see here is that you can put in just the statistics, T of 47 equals uh, uh, 2, 1, and then do some analysis of how replicable this is, how reliable this is. So we have a lot of tools to do this. Typically, I think a lot of us know uh, about meta-analysis, so uh, summarizing an entire literature. But now we have tools like excess significance, p-curve, and so forth. I'm going to show you an example. So if we take, there's some demo data. This is real data. So let's take Amy Cuddy with the power posing. You know, the power posing influences all sorts of things. And let's have a look at what uh, the research says. So I'm going to load this. And now you can see all the findings from that literature, including the original one, Carney, Cuddy, and Yap from 2010. What you can see is that if you do a P-curve, a p-curve shows you that instead of the exponential, so you know this kind of the high, the high ones are on the left, and then it decreases. What you can see is this up and down, up and down over here. So it's not the so the green is the one that it's supposed to be. What you can you can see from the literature is that it's not exactly the way that things are, and this tool also gives you a, a summary of this. Does, do these studies contain evidential value? So if you look at all this literature, does it really show strong value? Uh, evidential value and and the answer is not because this p-value is not lower than 0 0.05 now the second one is important given this evidence is it inadequate is there potential for p-hacking for questionable research practices and the p-value is lower than 0 0.05 so this is clearly an indication that the power posing literature has problems and you can do a lot of very cool stuff with this uh with this one you, you can play around with it but Right now, in meta-analysis, this is mandatory. So we do p-curves and we do excess significance because we need to see 
how reliable these literatures are. Not just aggregate them and say yeah, everything is okay, but actually look at what it is that they've done. Maybe they've been biased. Maybe there's some indication for publication. Now, another thing that we've been doing is we were not careful enough. So a lot of the published findings have bad statistics. We haven't checked this because nobody checks articles. No, we just assume that things are okay. But if you go over here, p-values, are the p-values correct? So now we have a lot of uh, uh, tools that are able to just download from your article. So you upload the PDF, it extracts all of the uh, statistics, and it tells you if there's a statistical error in there. So it compares the, uh, the statistics to the p-value, and then it tells you if there's a problem, an indication of a problem or not. So is there a reporting error or not? So it just goes over the entire literature. And sometimes, every, every once in a while, there's something that indicates that there's just bad statistics in there because we haven't checked the statistics well. But now we have automated tools. And it's amazing, this kind of, uh, this kind of power. And it's amazing that we haven't done this before 2012. Okay. So I don't know how much more time. I think I, I took more, more time than uh, I needed to. I just wanted to conclude... Sorry? Do, do you want me to keep going? I think so. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, so you want me to talk a little bit about my solutions to this? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So... My conclusion uh, from all of this, I started this when I was a postdoc in Maastricht University, is that I'm going to do uh, very specific types of projects. I'm not going to try anything new because we, I don't know what worked for me before. So I'm going to do only two types of projects. I'm either going to do pre-registered replications or pre-registered meta-analysis, and we can talk about what that means. What I want to say is that when I came to University of Hong Kong, I decided that I want to work with students to do this, not only researchers, because if it will just be uh, you and I, it will take decades just to verify what the others did you know, up till now. So we need to mass mobilize our classes to be able to do this. Now, there is no good summary of the science crisis. So for the first two semesters, the students ask me, so where's the book that we can read about this? And I said, I'm sorry, there's no book. And then finally, in the last semester, I told the students, there is no book, let's write this together. So my students wrote this. So now you can go on here. And they, they wrote this 200 pages book about all the evolution of, uh, of the science crisis. Uh, it's amazing. And now I do everything this way. It's a Google Doc. It's collaborative. Anybody can go in and edit each other. So the students do their work. Then I have teaching assistants that go and give them comments. And then I post this on Twitter. And I said, who is interested in helping us write a book on this? So we've had other researchers come in and give us feedback on this, and we're going to improve this. So if there's already a preprint, you can go in and you can download this. It's not perfect because you know students wrote it, but it's a first step. And it shows the power of collaboration in getting us to, to achieve uh, what it is that's, that's needed. So typically the way that I summarize the crisis is that uh, I'm convinced that there's a crisis, but there's some people that still push back very hard on this. And then I say, it's okay if you, if you don't believe that there's a crisis, but at least know that all these things are happening and then we can have a, a conversation about this. This is what I decided to do. So when I was a postdoc in Maastricht University, I set these uh, principles for myself. And the principles are uh, very, very, very uh, simple things that I took from different people. So I'm looking at simple effects, may maybe main effects. So no more this moderation, mediation, multi-level, because we know that we need very large samples for that. I'm going to pre-register everything. So pre-registration is one of the things that medical sciences have known to do uh, for, for uh, uh, quite some time, but the other sciences have not. So we take our plan and in advance, before data collection, we upload this to a public website, we timestamp this, and then we begin data collection. Unfortunately, also in medical sciences, but uh, especially everywhere else, we don't check our, our pre-registration. So doing pre-registrations, doing registered reports, uh, doing a lot of replications, but this is the most important thing because we fail on this. Doing full transparency, sharing all the materials, all the code, uh, all the research decisions, and so forth. Okay, so each each step of the life cycle of uh, research has a problem, 
I'm not going to go into this. I'm going to uh, jump ahead. So this is what I decided to do with my students. A lot of peer register applications and peer register meta-analysis. At the beginning, people said, why are you doing this? This is career suicide. Nobody's going to uh, publish your, your applications. But some students started working with me on this, and we did all sorts of things, and we did a meta-analysis. And the interesting thing is that when we announced to the world that we're going to do replications and meta-analysis, suddenly we got, we got attention because nobody else was doing this. So here's an example. So I asked my student, this is a master's student, to go on ResearchGate, and this is kind of like an academic Facebook, and just write, this project is supposed to uh, conduct a pre-registered replication and meta-analysis. And then suddenly an editor in a journal called Cognition and Emotion came and asked my student whether we would consider uh, submitting this to that journal. And at the beginning, you know, he was very excited and told him, wait, it takes a long time, I don't know, you know, it's the editor, then we have reviewers. But finally, uh, we, we discovered that it is possible to publish uh, replications because now there's a little bit more uh, interest in this because we realized that there's a crisis. So we did this at the beginning, 2017, in two journals. And then I realized it's possible to publish uh, pre-registered replications. So I, I try to uh, do more. In, and, and he keeps doing this. He keeps going after my students on ResearchGate and asking us to submit. And he's not the only one on Twitter. There's some open science uh, uh, editors that are looking for applications because we need to verify what we uh, studied before. Now, a lot of people ask, does a pre-registration or using registered report, does this really help anything? How does this solve uh, a problem? Now, there's two models. I'm not going to go into much detail into this. Pre-registration is you by yourself making a plan and uploading this to a public website and putting a timestamp. Registered reports is a model that now has more than 200 journals supporting it, where you take your pre-registration and you submit this to the journal. And in the journal, the peer review is over your pre-registration before data collection. And then they give you actual constructive feedback on how to improve. After you both agree that this is a good plan, they give you in principle acceptance. It doesn't matter. It comes out significant, not significant. You found support. You didn't find support. It doesn't matter. It's going to be guaranteed to be published as long as you follow your pre-registration plan. This is how science should have been, but was not. And now we're changing this. So this is a lot to do. Uh, with Chris Chambers. At the beginning, we didn't, have, uh, uh, we didn't have evidence that this is working. But little by little, now that we've had uh, uh, a few years of doing registered report, we realize that this is a good tool against p-hacking. Because you don't see the data. In advance, you have to agree that you're doing uh, everything as, as, as needed. Here's an example from a science paper about something called money priming. So if you see money, money is next to you, you touch money and all this. It makes you more selfish. It used to be something that we were very proud of in social psychology and, and, and talked about. But this is what the meta-analysis of the published findings, 174 published findings. This is the meta-analysis plot. Now, if you don't know meta-analysis, I'm going to uh, take my word for it. This plot is messy. So if you do a meta-analysis and you do a funnel plot, just by the randomness of the universe, this plot should all fall under the triangle. So anything that goes uh, aside from the triangle is indicative of some publication bias. So there's some uh, issue here. You're not publishing everything that you have. So if we look at the published findings, we see a big mess, and we see some indication over here of a publication bias. But if we look at the pre-registered effect, and now we have 51 of those, suddenly everything as it should be. Everything is harmonious. Everything is re representative of what we expect evidence to be. We have more of this. This just came out uh, uh, now in, in 2020. So the differences in, you know, was the first hypothesis supported? So standard reports, the way that we've been doing, suddenly all the, all the hypotheses were supported. But if you do registered reports, you realize that not everything works. You know, you have some hypotheses, some are supported, some are not. So just by using registered reports, things uh, change. There's also, this is for medicine. So before pre-registration, 57 success rate. But this is, I can't remember, something in, in cancer, uh, clinical trials of, I can't remember what. But then it falls down to about 8% success, and then you can see that most of them fall under the null. So registered reports are a good way to fight questionable research practices, to fight the, these uh, p-hacking 
uh, practices. Okay, let me see what else. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna jump about the whole process. If you wanna talk to me uh, about this afterwards, we can. But what I decided to do in each one of my courses, and have, I've had three semesters so far, is get students from second year undergraduates to do replications. They do real science. The, uh, maybe I should show this. So this is the process that we do. We do a survey, so it's much easier for us. We don't need to bring people in the lab and do interventions. We do, we do a survey. We, rand, we uh, generate a random data set, and then we uh, uh, do a data analysis plan. Then they write a pre-registration report. Then they get a lot of external feedback. First of all, they peer review each other. Then I have TAs, then there's me. And then I post everything on Twitter to say, we want open peer review. Who is going to give us feedback? Then they have one week to revise. Then I do all the pre-registration and data collection. I go on a public website. I upload everything and I put a timestamp. Then I collect the data. I give them data sets. They analyze this separately, then they peer review one another, then external peer reviewers from uh, Twitter. And finally, they have uh, a week to revise a uh, final report. Here at the end, we have submission-ready manuscript. So the students are supposed to hand in, in their courses, something that we should ideally be able to submit to a journal. So lots of checks and balances. How many of these did we do? So uh, end of last semester, 57. By the end of this semester, we'll have 80 of these. So this is just one lab, this is just our course. So we don't need necessarily all these mass replication projects you know, where you have a lot of people. We, we, we need all of that for some purposes, but we can also do this in our own individual lab. So we completed 57 and what's interesting is that in my domain, judgment decision making, it seems to have high replicability rate. There's some things that are inconclusive, but even in the things that are inconclusive and unsuccessful, the students were able to find errors in the articles, misalignment between the tables, the figures, and the text. They were able to identify all sorts of things that just couldn't be. And in almost all of these inconclusive, unsuccessful, we were able to identify how we could improve for future research. And all this is undergraduates from Hong Kong. At the beginning, when I sent emails and I told people we're going to do replications in Hong Kong, undergraduates, online samples, survey, and all these people said, this is never going to work. This is not how you do things. But this is to show that we're capable of running this in our classes. So we did a bunch of things. In the abstract that I sent you, if you got this abstract, there's lots of resources that we developed. So by doing replications and by opening up, everything here is Google Doc. Everything you can go in and contribute. You can join any one of these efforts. The students, the TAs, I, my collaborators all work together to give a guide on how do you do effect size calculation? How do you do confidence intervals? How do you do power analysis? How do you design a good survey? And now it's, it's open. You can go in and collaborate. You can put in your name. And then when we submit this to a journal, you will get co-authorship. So all this is open to you. So if you want to see what students are capable of, these students blew my mind. It's unbelievable. If you let students, you show them the way, you open the path, you just show them what the, the target is, they're able to do amazing things, so you're welcome to go on and, and check this. Some of these are so good that we can take them as is and submit this to the journals. We don't, and I'm going to tell you what is the last step, and this is like an open invitation for you. So they did all of this. I've never done in my PhD. I didn't even know how to do a forest plot, but they did this by themselves. I did not teach them how to do this. So they're very good with technology. They can teach themselves R, so they've done this on their own. They've done all these plots. I learn a lot from them. Uh, a remarkable thing. So this is just copy paste from their presentations. Uh, really remarkable stuff. And when I show this to the people, say that this is remarkable work. Thank you for sharing. I'm truly amazed by the quality of the work. Uh, I don't think even our first uh, PhD, first year PhD students in the business school are able to do anything like that. But I think this is evidence that you could if you wanted to. You just need to kind of open up, structure things the right way. And, and give them uh, uh, the possibility. Now, a lot of people are saying, can we publish this kind of research? But now there are uh, journal editors that come from the open science movement, like Chris Chambers. He's the guy who introduced registered reports. Before Chris Chambers, there was no re registered reports. So he is now an editor, Chris Chambers, of Royal Society of Open Science. If you care about impact factors, this is the impact factor. And this is what he wrote. And this is a guarantee. And he lives up to it. Now we know for two years he's been doing this. 
So here at Royal Society of Open Science, we guarantee to publish any close replication of any article published in our journal and from most other journals too. So if you have any replication and you don't know where to publish it, they will publish it. And it's not just in psychology, they will do this in any field. In social psychology, there's a bunch of other journals that now publish this. We have other journals that are doing this. Now, the model that we work, now that we have 57 of these replications or 80 by the end of the semester, is that these are students. So they've done a good work and we've done checks and balances to see that there's not a lot of error, but still we need help to verify this. We need scholars to verify this. So we invite people to become lead authors. So we give you everything that we've done and you become the first author. You verify this, you add your own analysis, you make sure that the introduction and discussion are fair and representative of the literature and you help submit this to the, to the journal. And now we have about 30 of these projects that are waiting for people from around the world to work with us. But now we have a lot of these collaborators. We have 15 of these collaborators from around the world, a lot of countries uh, uh, that, that help us uh, with this. And we have some results. So just from the last month, we've had these three publications. So these uh, first authors are people that came in, followed by my students, and then me finally uh, trading at the end. And then we have a lot of preprints. Uh, pre so everything we just share when it comes out, we just put everything out. So there's a lot of things, potential, for you to come and collaborate, help us bring this to publication if you're interested. I just want to share the last two slides, uh, the reactions from uh, the media for this kind of open science initiative where everybody works together. Uh, this, I think the students were very happy to see that uh, the British uh, Psychological Society writes about them. So good news for science, bad news for humanity, the bias blinds are just replicated. But I really like this one in psychology today. So for a student to see that their research is featured in the psychology today is a big deal. But even more big deal is this conclusion. So aside from p-hacking and the open science movement and credibility revolution, I want you to take this away. I want you to understand that we can do science better by mass mobilizing and working with our students, working together. So this is the conclusion that they had. I am particularly impressed by this work because not only was the replication attempt done right with pre-registered plan, complete transparency, including open data and theoretically interesting extension, this is good evidence that rigorous replications can be run by researchers who do not yet have a PhD. Perfect. So some people saying, you know, you need to be at least second year undergraduate, but I already know that some people are running this with high school students. And the amazing thing about this, the, the newer generation, that they're so good with technology and they don't have the biases that we have. They were not trained to look for p-value lower than 0.05. They're a blank slate and they ask the right question and their naivety helps us to do better science. So uh, a lot of other things, uh, everything that I just showed you about our project, about open science initiatives, the replication crisis, all the resources that are available for you to come in and collaborate, Everything is on this page. So you can just go scan this or go on that URL over there. It's a very long list of all the resources, our team, uh, all the preprints, uh, all the publications that we've had, all the invitations, what is planned for next year, what we've done in the last year. All this is summarized in this page. Of course, if you have any questions, uh, not just now, but also in the future, you want to talk to me, then a lot of ways to contact me. This is my website, my email. I'm very active on Twitter. A lot of people from the open science community are very active on Twitter. And we also have a mailing list where we update people about all the things that we've developed uh, over time, all the resources that you can use in your own labs, in your own research, and opportunities for you to collaborate. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and if you have any questions, we can talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very amazing talk. Yeah. So maybe you could uh, ask some questions, maybe discuss a little bit. What's your vision for the next, like, Yeah, I think it's the end of the big journals doing what it is that they did. Uh, and I think they are facing two options, die or adjust, improve, uh, do things differently. Uh, the problem is, is that many of these journals are very slow to adapt. It takes them uh, some time. But I think some of them, there's some indications, like for example, Nature Human Behavior, a new journal targeted 
for the behavioral sciences, uh, which is definitely doing things right. So they're doing registered reports. Uh, they're doing mass collaborations. They're opening everything up. Everything needs to be uh, open. Not needs to be, but there's a strong incentive for open data and sharing uh, sharing it all. And they're they're not. Uh, they don't care about whether the results is significant, not significant. So they're doing this right, uh, and it's nice because they're once they're doing this, the other journals feel more comfortable to do this. So there's some indication that some are are, are improving. However, because we've submitted a lot of these replications, even for the journals that are supportive of open science, we know how difficult this is because there's so many gatekeepers. On one side, you have the journals and their policies with the editors, but then you have the action editors, you know, the associate editors or the editorial board. And then uh, you have the reviewers and the reviewers still don't get open science and they don't understand some of these things. And they still, when you submit a replication, they say, but why is this interesting? This was already published before. So there's lots of biases, and in the open science community, we're trying to target all of these. There's lots of initiatives. So, for example, Chris Chambers with the register report, we're trying to put pressure on journals to establish register report and to teach them how to do this well. Uh, we're trying to get, you know, uh, we had this, it's called Pro Initiative, Peer Review Openness Initiative, where we say as reviewers, early career researchers, we have power. We say we're not going to review this paper if it doesn't have open data and open code. We want to see the data in the code. We just, we're not going to take your word for it. So either you share everything or uh, explain why it's not possible, privacy, and then we can discuss this, or we're not going to uh, review this. And this has changed the policy of a lot of journals because they became tired of getting refusals from, from reviewers. So even early career researchers, we're the one who do, who do the reviews. If we say no and we want openness, then it's going to happen. So there's lots of initiatives from the open science community. Some big scholars or, you know, the bureaucracy is pushing back. But I think it's a matter of time, uh, especially in social psychology. It's already happening in five years. It's going to be uh, all across psychology, I feel. And I'm really, really hopeful that this is going to happen in, in like science overall, that even science and nature and, you know, the role of society and and all this are going to pick this up and going to implement this. It cannot stay the, the way uh, that, that it was. Uh, it, has, it has to change. Uh, we know that, we, we, uh, that the things that we've been doing uh, need adjustment, and it's up to us to, to try and fix this as fast as, as possible. I think there is no better uh, evidence for the need for openness from where we are right now with the situation with the coronavirus. It's like if it would take you know, three years for us to publish a paper on coronavirus, is it's, 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 we're never going to solve this. But if we need to work together, now you understand how you need fast uh, dissemination of uh, research data, you know, of openness, of preprints before publication, get, get things out as fast as possible and work together in complete transparency. That's the way that you do science. It has to change. And what do you think about the other views that you mentioned, like medicine, psychiatry, neuroscience? You think they are doing? Uh, you think they are uh, having the same effort as psychology? Because it doesn't seem to be, in my opinion, aside yeah. from clinical trials. I mean, because clinical trials yeah. have been for a long time. You you need to be registered, but other kind of research like cross-sectional studies, cohort studies. Yeah, so I, I don't know much about it, but I will say that before the current crisis in 2005, there was a seminal paper by Ionidas uh, that was about medical research saying why most of published findings are false. Yeah. And this guy has been uh, consistently bringing out, out papers that show things in the medical sciences in terms of all the biases. So there's, there's some groups that are working on this in other fields that are trying to push the disciplines. But for some reason, there's so much resistance. And I think it has to do uh, with money and incentives, you know, pharmaceutical companies or other uh, uh, organizations or institutes that, that gain uh, from this. Uh, and I think the change is going to happen from the grant authorities. Um, we're not going to give you uh, money if you don't uh, open this whole thing. So maybe that's a source for change. Uh, maybe situations like the coronavirus, I don't really know. Uh, there's some change, but I, in my opinion, not fast enough. What I can say, because I don't know much about the other disciplines, is that we've been doing this for a while in psychology, and I've been like in this project for about three years. Uh, the interesting thing is that we used to be all alone, and we used to be judged 
by other sciences. And now, finally, it's great that other sciences are reaching out and wanting to work with us. And we realize that science is science. The way that we do statistics, it doesn't matter if it's psychology or it's chemical or medical sciences, and we can work together to develop tools. So now we have collaborators from other fields and we do stuff together. So hopefully we can even bridge between disciplines and work with other people in other fields, which is why I go around and I give talks in places that are not psychology related. So hopefully this will give us a, a better opportunity to improve science overall and not just psychology. Are you familiar with uh, the work of Amy Orban? She publishes in Nature Human Behavior, okay. uh, doing the so-called multiverse analysis. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, do you think that would be interesting in the cases of cohort studies, cross-sectional studies? Yeah, so there's there's lots of, uh, yeah, so she does amazing things. There's also like the reproducibility uh, podcast and, uh, and, and these sessions where people come together and they talk about uh, uh, articles together and now it's this big movement with 40 uh, different places around the world that do these journal clubs um, so they're doing really good research and they're coming up with more solutions so we need more of these solutions uh, and we need to test those to see uh, what's relevant and what's not relevant so definitely the multiverse uh, analysis is good for some things uh, perhaps not as good for other things and we need to kind of find like even multiverse tech you need to know how to do this well and you need to define because right? it's so yeah. complex and yeah. Yeah, um, right. And you also, there's issues of power. There's like all sorts of things that we need to uh, take into consideration, but it's exciting because we haven't considered these before. You know, just modeling the flexibility uh, that, pe that people have. So first we understand that we need transparency. So first of all, we need to be completely transparent about all the decisions. And then we need to check Perhaps there's another way of looking at the data that might lead to uh, different results and check robustness. So multiverse is definitely one very exciting uh, direction. So together with all these initiatives coming out, hopefully we can improve that. But definitely look into multiverse. This is this is a really good thing uh, to to look at. You know how robust findings are based on one forking path, one analysis path uh, that people, the researchers, have followed. Another way to address this, you know, it's not a multiverse, but instead of doing many labs for replicating something that we uh, published before, it's like taking the same hypothesis and outsourcing this, crowdsourcing this to a lot of people to how would you test this? And then running this together. So we have projects from Eric Ullman and a few others that also published in, uh, in good journals, uh, Perspectives or Advanced Methods and Practices of Psychological Science, where they suggest new ways of uh, looking at things that are either modeled or crowdsourced by using the, the power of people working together. But yeah, exciting stuff, and it's amazing that this stuff uh, is coming from psychology. Great talk. Uh, Thank you for being here. And I think that it refreshes and, and remember us all of this uh, bad science uh, protocols and procedures that we, we sometimes, uh, even unconsciously, perform. Um, I was wondering, well, you presented some journals that, that are already uh, publishing uh, replication studies, like the Royal Society. Yes. There is not a single journal like the, the Reproducibility Journal or something like this, like, like the Journal of Negative Results. Or that, do, you know, do you know some journal specific to it? Or? Yeah. Uh, so I guess some journals took more responsibility than others, and then people started sending more research over there. But I think we would like this to not happen in the sense that it could be a good way to start. But at the end, journals should take responsibility for their findings. Uh, there's all sorts of suggestions for that, what that might mean. But one of the suggestions uh, is, is that if you published one finding, so whoever does replications, could submit this to the journal and be published just next to it. So you'll open the, the evidence and you'll see everything that follows. Nice. So there's some exciting uh, projects like uh, Curate Science. So rather than a journal, we have uh, uh, infrastructure that helps kind of aggregate these things together and keep track of these things. So Curate Science is, is a really exciting uh, one. Oops, sorry. 
So over here, uh, you can actually open an author uh, page and uh, upload your, uh, your stuff in there. But there's one over here uh, that tracks uh, replications. So you can see all the replications that have been done. So they've tracked over a thousand ones. So they try to kind of aggregate everything and they also do an automatic meta-analysis. So this is one of these things. If you want to track, for example, what journals are more accepting of registered reports uh, and accepting of uh, openness practices. So now we've initiated, we, uh, the Center of Open Science initiated something called the top um, uh, journal ranking. So I'm gonna show you. Um, yeah, so top guidelines. So uh, this open science community came up with some guidelines of what it means to be open, who is accepting those replications, and, and, and all sorts of uh, stuff like that. And you can see uh, the top factor, what it means, how to use it, uh, all sorts of things. But you can also see a summary table. Uh, of the of the guidelines and also which journals are implementing uh, this, uh, what it means to uh, implement this. So there's a lot of things, top implementers, so some of, of those uh, journals have uh, started to implement this. Uh, and now they have a ranking that is supposed to compete with impact factor, where it focuses on replication, openness, uh, stuff like that. And in terms of registered reports, you can see uh, COSIO, I think it's, yeah. I think it's this one. So if you want to know which journals are doing registered reports and they will publish replications regardless of the outcome, so you can submit your uh, registered reports to this. It, it, it explains exactly what the process is. So first you design the study and you send your pre-registration, you send the design out for review, you get in principle acceptance and then only the, the stage two report, uh, sorry, the stage two peer review is only to verify that you follow the plan from the first stage. And who is participating? So right now we have 242 journals, and you can have a look and see uh, which ones are relevant for you. So you can see like BMC Biology. So there's quite a few of these journals that will accept the plan and they're supporting of replications as well. And this is what we want. We want more of the classic journals uh, doing, yeah, doing these things. Uh, we also want, you know, Career-wise, for some reason, some universities, governments, uh, hiring committees care about impact factors and number of publications. So still, you want the incentives uh, to be aligned to allow people to do replications and not, you know, uh, be filtered out of the system, but be able to do research. So you need people who do novel research, new research, but you also need the people who do replications, and both of them need to be in the same journals of the same impact, so forth and so forth. Just one last question. Yeah. Um, as an expert in the field, how many replications do you feel that should be um, performed for each study, like for, I don't know, recent study by Peter Zimbrab, yeah. Region 1 in Stanford, yeah. you know, a classical one in social psychiatry? Right. So, how, how many, just one replication should be fine to, to, for us to, to, to take for granted? that these effects exist, or uh, do you think that this should be like many, many stages and then uh, Yeah, this is the, the, that's a good question. I think we're trying to figure out what this means. What is one replication? What does it mean? How many people are involved? What is the sample size, the power? How precise are the measurements? So there's so many things that we can vary in doing a replication. Yeah. Now we need to take all these factors into control and try to understand what does it mean to do a replication. And it's, it's funny that, you know, I expected going into a PhD that science would have solved the issue of how do we do replications. And now I'm realizing, you know, uh, after all the PhD, postdoc, you know, that we don't know how to do replications and we need to figure out these kinds of, of, of issues. You know, even with ego depletion, after two mass collaborations, some people are saying, no, but there's something there. Like, there has to be something there. So we need more replications. And I'm like, we've wasted millions. There's so many people involved. Enough with this. You know, now we need to move on and, and focus on, on other things. So people put the threshold on, you know, different levels. Uh, I, but I, I agree that we need to come to kind of like a common criteria of when do we say that enough is enough or what kind of, even, even the novel evidence, 
published somewhere, somebody did something new. When do you publish this? Or when do you say that this is sufficient in order to communicate this to doctors, communicate this to the public? When do you say that something is good evidence or not? Uh, little by little, like the P-curve or some other things, we're developing statistical tools to allow us to aggregate and come to a conclusion. But we still don't have like a criteria of this number of publications or this number of replications or this number of sample size. Uh, it's, it's still work in progress, but we need more people working on this in order to uh, establish some criteria in order to help us uh, make sense of this mess, because right now we don't really know. Yeah. Uh, I'm part of the Paris Party because uh, we're trying to establish uh, innovation and social entrepreneurship uh, for mental health care. And one of the major issues that we have is uh, usually the timelines on the top of the government staff's interventions did not follow the uh, clinical validation uh, timelines. Yes. So how could we make this bridge in terms of uh, developing uh, product uh, going into market? We know that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lack of evidence of the current uh, solutions are already available on the market, but now even those scarce uh, publications, we cannot question if they were uh, actually true or not. But how do you see this, uh, this mixture in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, develop products to go to market, uh, at the same time having good uh, data to yes. make the evidence of this product? Yeah, so this is a really good question. So there's lots of issues involved in this. Um, but so this is my own opinion. And if you ask different people in the open science movement, I think they'll have different answers for you. But the way that I see this in terms of, you said before, five years ahead, 10 years ahead, where are we going? So a lot of people have a lot of concern with complete openness about everything because some of it is reliable some of it is junk how do you know this is solid evidence or not solid evidence or how do you uh, you know separate the ones that can be published in uh, uh, journals and ones that are just like uh, laying around or whatever so we have this system of peer review it's a system that's been going on 200 300 400 years and this is how we've been doing things the old model we need to reinvent ourselves. And now we have technology and we have ways to, to do this. If we need people to go over everything, um, then it's going to take time. And, you know, peer review is typically at best two, three months, and then you have uh, revisions and you have another round. But you need to get there faster. Now with the corona, we can't wait for these things to... And we need a way of aggregating things faster. And we need a way of making sense of science faster and and more and, and more meaningful, more meaningful way. And the problem is is that a lot of things about the way that we do science are broken. For example, why do we publish PDFs? You can't extract information from there. You can do all sorts of text analysis. But this is not a way, you know. So meta analysis comes out any five, ten years. You know, it takes a while. Somebody sits down, they code everything by hand. You know, and then they put this, and then they run analysis. By the time that the meta-analysis comes out, it's, it's already outdated. Now, some people in the open science movement, we have this amazing conference called the Society of Improvement of Psychological Science. It's a different kind of conference because in this conference, instead of somebody standing and telling you how great their research is, people sit together in a round table and they hack. We do hackathons. We work on solutions. In the last SIPs, in the last conference, we've had people who are working on how to code better science so that when you write a manuscript, it's automatically coded and then automatically uh, uploaded into a meta-analysis generator that will give you the best up-to-date uh, evidence right now. So we need to change a few components about the way that we do research for things to be communicated faster. Also, algorithms, technology assisted by people, at least at the first stage, can help you understand what is better evidence, what is less uh, reliable evidence. So now we have all sorts of uh, cues. For example, we know sample size is important. We know that design is important. We know that you know even p-values to some extent add a little bit of information about how replicable something is. So if you add all of these together, and these are automatically coded and extracted from your article, 
then we can already give you back immediately. You upload a PDF or you upload your, your research. It extracts, it gives it back to you, and it gives you uh, some kind of conclusion. So this is like a first step in order for us to do things quicker, uh, uh, better. So, you know, it happens in other entrepreneurship. So, for example, we used to have maps and find our way from the hotel to the university. But now we give ourselves to this algorithm of ways or Google map to help us navigate through, through this world. And we need to be able to do better science. We need help of uh, technology. So this is one, this is one uh, avenue. There's other things that we can do as human beings in order to uh, accelerate all these things. And this is happening now with the coronavirus. But even with this, it's, it's happening too slow and we're not doing it uh, good enough. Uh, but the good thing is that people in the Society of Improvement of Psychological Science, people like uh, the developers of the multiverse, a lot of people in the open science community are trying to build these tools to help us do better. Uh, on one side, terrifying times. On the other side, very exciting times because now we understand that we can accelerate things a lot better. We know how to work together better. We know how to assess things better. We don't just take things for granted, like published in science by somebody from Princeton, Harvard, therefore it's true. Now we know that we need to assess things more carefully. And how well do you think that uh, the scientific community is prepared to incorporate technology on this kind of assessment? Not very good. Uh, so I think the, the problem in the last conference, for example, where people are working on coding and all this is like, we're academics, we're researchers, we learned R as a side uh, hobby, you know, this sort of thing. And we need developers who know how to do code, know how to do projects. Um, and it's just, it's amazing. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with R, you know, studio and how this, so we used to use SPSS, Stata, uh, SAS, which is horrible for open science. First of all, it's proprietary, it, it costs money. Students, it's like a lot of issues, but it's not good for reproducibility. And R is much more targeted to that. So anybody can uh, write, write a package. We can verify this whole thing together. It's like this open peer review. GitHub helps us with you know, putting uh, issues and all this. Uh, so now psychologists slash scientists are discovering the power of open source, of open community. Um, but there's so much for us to kind of work together. And R is a good example where technology of a programming language meets the needs of science and somehow they come together. So all these shiny apps, we didn't have this 10 years ago. Now I can show you very easily simulations of very complex uh, statistics. We didn't know how to do power analysis. So we, you know, we ran some dialog boxes and we came to a conclusion and didn't we, know, we didn't even know what was going uh, underneath. But now, now we do. So we need a lot more people coming from technology, uh, from the outside of sciences to kind of join us. And more and more conferences are much more open to having non-academics and giving them a stage and sitting down together with them to understand how to bring this uh, to implementation. Because as scientists, we're not very good at managing. We're definitely not good at technology. And we need people who understand this sort of thing. Do you think it's the end of simple statistics? Like everyone in the future, we need to know R, Python, and all specification curve analysis, all this complex stuff? I, I think we'll have bo both. On, on one side, we're increasing complexity in the sense that we're moving, you know, we're moving away from dialogue boxes and we need to uh, sometimes write code or at least understand what's happening with this code. But on the other side, we have much, much more powerful tools to run uh, amazing things because of, of, of this technology. One of the things that I work in, the only reason why this is possible, the mass replication projects with undergraduate students, is because we have templates. We have code syntax that they can copy snippets, that they can copy paste into their R or Jamovi. So by themselves, let's say, if I will tell them, I don't have anything for you, go figure out how to run an ANOVA. They was like, I don't know what you're talking about. but. If we have a well-structured guide with code snippets that they can go in and, and come in, they understand these code snippets and how to vary them, uh, but also very, very easy implementation of those. So on one side, it's becoming more complex, but on the other side, we're having standards and we're having ways to get more people to use these complex, uh, these complex statistics. And it has to come together. Uh, but at the end, we need at least the good thing about open peer review 
is that there's no one person that can do everything. There's no one person that can be a specialist about everything. Open peer review makes sure that statisticians can review this. You know, people that are experts in the field can, uh, people from technology can come in and, 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 give, and give input. And so only if by making it open, only by inviting a lot of people with different skills, are you able to optimize what it is that you deliver, your outputs. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you once again. Yes, thank you. We can proceed to our discussion.